Greetings and welcome to Parker University. We have two distinguished guests here with us today, Dr. Jeffrey Bove and Dr. Brian Budgel. Thank you. Um, both PhD DCs and ex their expertise is in neurophysiology. And it's been an honor to have you at the campus today as we've worked on hopefully some potential uh, collaborations. Um, Jeffrey, could you tell us a little bit about your background? Um, well, I went into chiropractic. I got interested in going into chiropractic healthcare in the early 80s. I had been a injured professional ballet dancer for a very short period of time, and I thought I'd be um, the chiropractor to the ballet stars. Um, <clears throat> that didn't go well. I ended up uh, entering private practice in North Carolina in the late 90s, late 80s, and soon after I decided that I wanted to pursue a degree and do research and be an anatomy professor. And so I did that through the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And then I've been pursuing a career in academia and research ever since then. Very good. Dr. Budgel. Yeah, I was, uh, I guess, introduced to chiropractic through a martial arts injury and had a good response to treatment and had it in the back of my mind that that might be an interesting thing to do with my life. Um, I had been an educator in, uh, in healthcare and uh, eventually decided that chiropractic was what I wanted to do with my life, went and enrolled at, uh, at CMCC, and the rest is hysteria. Hysteria. So, and where are some of the places you've worked and some, some of your research background and, and study background? Um, I, I was very fortunate that uh, after spending some time in practice in Toronto, I had my own clinic for about uh, six years, I was able to go to Japan uh, for what I thought was one or two years to work in uh, a very fine laboratory there. As you understand, it turned out to be 14 years after all, um, but during that time had access to wonderful resources to investigate primarily somatoautonomic reflexes. Yeah, but how about you, Jeff? You had an and interesting path as well. I kind of fell into the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, um, because I was practicing nearby. I didn't know that it was a world-class research institution, and I didn't know that my research grandfather had coined the term nociceptor. Um, so I was working with people who were far more qualified, and I hate to use the word, I guess, pedigreed, but pedigreed. But that pedigree wore off a little bit on me, and I um, was able to uh, break a ceiling in being the first chiropractor to be faculty at Harvard Medical School, uh, which was difficult as a chiropractor um, to do that. There was some reticence to, to me, even as a PhD, as a neurobiology researcher. But just struggle on and be persistent, and things go off in the way you want. That's awesome. Very interesting background. <clears throat> now, how did you get involved in neurosciences? Um, I was always interested in uh, pain mechanisms, and from the clinical standpoint, I didn't understand with my what I consider an outstanding education from CMCC as well. Brian and I were a year up, apart at Canadian Memorial Chiropractic College, so I wanted to learn about the basic physiology and the uh, sensory systems, which starts with nociceptors. Uh, that's the first pathway, the first signaling on the way to the perception of pain. So I, that's what I've been studying. I understand. You, when you started college, Parker didn't exist. Otherwise, you probably would have applied here. This is very true. Yes. Yeah. So, by the way, I always refer to these these doctors as the most underappreciated researchers in chiropractic because mainly you do most of your publishing in, in more medical-oriented journals. Is that true? Or basic. Basic science journals? Basic science journals. Mm -hmm. So we've had some interesting discussions today, um, even talking about um, the effect of spinal adjustments on organs. Mm -hmm. Brian, you want to fill in some of your work on that All topic? Right, yeah. Well, the, the reason that I got interested in research to begin with was that um, first as a young intern and, and then as an early practitioner, um, some of my students, uh, some of my, uh, my patients recovered quite dramatically from what appeared to be uh, visceral complaints as a result of the chiropractic treatment. And I wanted to understand how that could be so. And uh, that's why I ended up going to Dr. Sato's lab, because they were specialists <clears throat> in the, uh, the neurobiology, which is thought to underlie that sort of phenomenon. Uh, so I went off to, uh, to Japan and primarily used a model of back pain, the uh, induced experimental back pain in, in rats, and then studied the responses in 
the autonomic nerves and then in the organs which were served by those nerves. And um, in fact, the general pattern of what we found was quite consistent with what chiropractors have espoused for some time. Very good. So what's the relevance of neurosciences to chiropractic and clinical practice? What are the things that you're, like you're foundational scientist, how does that become relevant to, to me, the, the clinician? I think that the foundations of neuroscience form the profession. Um, for me, I've got to be able to talk to my patients and also to my colleagues in other professions to explain what I do. You, you understand that these days, uh, unlike when you and I graduated, nobody questions that chiropractors can fix neck pain and back pain. That's done. Um, when we're criticized these days, it's because of what people perceive as the lack of science uh, supporting the profession. So for our cultural authority, it's tremendously important that we be able to articulate what we do. Do you think most chiropractors can articulate the science behind chiropractic? Good heavens, no. Good heavens, no. Now, are we bone doctors or nerve doctors? Jeff? <laughs> Trick question. Yeah, I thought I'd throw that in there. <laughs> no, we're nerve doctors. We're nerve doctors. Period. Yeah, I agree. We, had, use, we, we leverage bones to our advantage. Yes, I, that's, that's good. And we, we talked a little bit about expanding the neuroeducation of chiropractors, maybe post, postgraduately. Any concepts or the vision of that? What, what is your vision for chiropractic to get the basic science into the hands of the chiropractor? Well, the, the very fundamental basic science can be used on every patient. The fundamental neuroscience uh, principles of how the sensory system is working and how the autonomics are working should inform and lead your diagnostic questioning and exam and finally diagnosis and approach to treatment of each patient. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, I can recall when I was starting out in practice, I would have my guidance physiology or my Candle and Schwartz uh, textbooks open every week to help me understand what was going on in my patients and to help me make better decisions. Very good. And what's the best way to move forward at this point? To move this profession forward? Oh, yeah. oh, be smarter. You know, we're, we're really good with what we do with our hands, but we don't understand um, what works and why it works. And um, if we are like that, if we only continue to practice what we have already done, then we remain a type of folk medicine. Um, there are certainly problems with conventional allopathic medicine, but we should learn from their strength, which has been that they, uh, they break down and they analyze what they do, they look at what works and what doesn't work, and they, they build on those strengths to improve treatment. And of course, the, the development of antibiotics is, is a good paradigm for that. We started with penicillin, but by understanding how penicillin works, it opened the door to so many other more powerful treatments. We need to be doing that with our techniques as well. I agree. And we talked about earlier about at the time chiropractic was discovered, the philosophy of all health professions were trying to reduce, get a reductionist view of what caused disease. And taking that in, into uh, the, the, the concept of when it happened, when chiropractic was discovered, really shows a lot about BJ or D.D. Palmer, what he, how he, he moved forward. Any ideas or, or any thoughts on what the world was like when chiropractic first was discovered? The scientific world of, of that time? Yeah. As uh, Jeff has suggested, it was the <clears throat> age of unifying theories. That's right. So there was, there was the germ theory, which for the medical profession became almost a unifying cause of disease. Um, we had shortly before that atomic theory, which was the, the unifying theory of matter. Um, we had the periodic table, which um, provided um, a single context within which to interpret the behavior of, of chemicals. So it was a time when people were looking for the one big answer for many challenges. So the fact that Didi came forward with what he saw at the time as a unifying cause of disease was not an outrageous thing for one man uh, to do. And certainly in the context of the time, in the context of the best available science, it was a reasonable theory that he came up with. Well, the, the science which he espoused was, in fact, conventional medical thought. He did not invent the term subluxation. He did not invent the term adjustment, and he did not invent the term chiropractor. All of those terms were in use prior to his birth. So 
right. prior prior to his birth. Yes. So 1820, 1820. 1820s, yeah, you can see subluxation and adjustment and chiropractor in the literature. I, I learned, seen I learned something today. That's amazing. So have we, as from that time, there's some chiropractors who, who would stick with the green books and not want to move forward. What do you think we should, should how should, how should the, the model for subluxation and chiropractic progress? Well, I think we should go back to the green books and start there and mine the green, mine the green books and the early concepts that underpin chiropractic. And you have to remember that there was no biomedical research related to chiropractic ideas. There almost isn't any now. I mean, it's been a very, it, it, was, it was difficult to get the funding to do the research. It was difficult to find reviewers to review the uh, applications that were coming into the National Institutes of Health up until very recently. Even now, it's difficult. But basically, we're 100 years, 75 or 100 years behind in chiropractic research. So there's, might as well go back and start where, it's, where we should have been able to. Start back. You were foundational researchers too. You start. Right. You start at the base, and you work in forward. I'm. <clears throat> I'm a clinician. I usually read clinical research. Some of the stuff you write maybe a little bit over my head, um, but it'd be, you know, it's, my, it's my goal to get your names more out there so people understand how important that research is and how and at the level that you're publishing and the, and the level of your researching. So, how do the basic science? What are the basic sciences say about the chiropractic management of visceral disease? Um. That's actually a very long question, isn't it? Because there are it's many about, patients about with many words, yeah. visceral um, <laughs> disorders. It's a, it's a complicated matter. Um, but the, the early observations of the first chiropractors um, were honest observations. They may have used a different vocabulary, um, but they weren't lying about what they saw, or at least I don't believe that that's um, the case. So we should take those observations and... Um, investigate them and update our concepts using uh, the modern lexicon. Mm -hmm. So that you know um, Dee Dee Palmer's first patient? Yes. Who had a hearing problem. I'm sorry? He, <laughs> and his second patient had, but that was the patient who led to the founding of, of chiropractic. Um, the second patient had cardiovascular disease. And when you read uh, Dee Dee Palmer's text, he talks about then it occurring to him that here was a pattern, that spinal disease led to visceral disease. And, and he was fundamentally correct. Um, it is the case. As you and I understand, this can't happen in every patient all the time. Um, but there are clearly patients in, in whom uh, visceral complaints do originate or, or are certainly facilitated by biomechanical disorders of, of the spine. And chiropractic is often a very good treatment option for those patients. Very good. Now, we've talked earlier about the, the progression of science, how we really need to lay the foundation and build upon the foundation. And we've had seen certain scientists that they'll have research that they'll extrapolate, they'll have a, a small end in their research, and they'll extrapolate miles down the road of how beneficial that was, basically skipping several steps mm -hmm. and sometimes that's damaging any, any thoughts on that that you'd like to share what are your um the two of us are pretty classical basic scientists so it is irksome would be a good word when uh, we, we 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 try to be very very clear about what we know versus what we think and it's not always the most comfortable approach for people to accept in fact, it makes people very uncomfortable to hear that nobody knows the answer to their question. But to us, that's kind of usually just forms a challenge. If there's observations and we don't know how something's happening, our job is to develop investigative tools to address that the hypothesis that those observations can generate. Now, what could I do <clears throat> at Parker to help generate the next generation or create the next generation of chiropractors who are going to be able to understand the science and apply that to their practices? Mm -hmm. um, people take science much too seriously uh, <laughs> and, and are looking to it for, um, for too many answers. Science is, is the endeavor of asking the questions. And um, we have to teach our young people 
to be comfortable with the uncertainty and to be uh, comfortable in the pursuit of knowledge rather than the, uh, the achievement, the idea that it's, it's a journey, oh. uh, not a destination. And, and to enjoy being out there at the, at the frontier when, when you don't know stuff, that's the most exciting place uh, to be. And, and I think one of the thrills that both Jeff, uh, Jeff and I have uh, both enjoyed is uh, two or three o'clock in the morning, knowing that you're the first guy in the world to understand something that you've just observed on an oscilloscope or through a microscope. Might be an arrogant thing, but it's usually we're our first thought if we have one of those aha moments or we've discovered something is who can I share it with? I just made a discovery that no yeah. one else in the planet has ever realized. That is yeah. that's pretty exciting. And you said, Brian, something interesting. People want certainty. Certainty, I find, is every student here wants the certainty. I want to know this is the place I need to adjust, that this is the best technique, that this will get the results. And there's people out there who give them certainty. That's yeah, a shame. Sadly true, yes. And yeah, you guys get it. <laughs> not everybody, when I have this talk about certainty, not everybody understands what I'm talking about. If I'm the guru who says, Jeff, if you do this technique and you do it to every patient and you do this, you'll get this result both physiologically but also monetarily. That's attractive. What I want to create is people who live, my students, who they can live in uncertainty but have confidence. There's a difference. Self-confidence and certainty are two different things. Certainty is the enemy of curiosity. As a scientist, you, you understand mm -hmm. the value of curiosity and that every morning when I get up, the first thing I do, I hate to say it, I, I get up and I'm kind of digging in. And it's social media, but we're, we're discuss, in social media, we're discussing some of the research articles. Like four in the morning, I'll be get up and doing mm -hmm. stupid. But, um, but also the curiosity that of other chiropractors not to, be, not to fall into the trap of seeking certainty or to the self-arrogance of, of acting like we know more than we do. Well, you've said it is a trap. Um, but people should recognize that. You should be able to smell that out. So thinking's hard work, too. I heard that. So any questions you want to ask me or each other? What brought you to Parker? Oh, it was awesome. Well, my background is clinical, clinical chiropractic, and arguably I, I kind of may have reached the high water mark for chiropractic. I, I worked in a tertiary care facility. I was on the, uh, some, some boards for the Navy for musculoskeletal care, took care of the White House. I mean, as a White House chiropractor, was a chiropractor to Congress, um, and pretty much had done that for a number of years. And I, I, did, I hadn't seen the rest of the profession rising up there. And I thought, you know what? I've done this. I'd love to go back and share this with students and share it with the rest of the profession and bring everybody along. That's wonderful. And yeah, I'm a clinician. I'm not a scientist. I'm not an educator. But I know what a good chiropractor should look like and, and what they should, what tools they should have. And I want to replicate good chiropractors. And I, you know, as, you, as our discussions, you realize that I really have a desire to expand our knowledge of neurology. Well, Park is lucky to have you. Oh, I, th I think that every chiropractor should be oh. a scientist. Well, it's, it's part of the complete practice. Right. I yeah. think that every chiropractor should, when they have a question, I think they should go consult um, the published literature, and if they don't find an answer, just beat it. But it's not, you know, beat it down and maybe call people and uh, share information, which social media is, if, you know, sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes that's a bad thing. But it does help... Um, Collective experiences are data. Yeah, right. It is. It's. It's. And and you're you're truly right. It's it's, <clears throat> it's it's learning every day. Coming in, the patient shows up. I don't know what's wrong. I, and then to research, take it upon yourself. That's my project for today. I'm I'm going to treat my all my other patients, but today I'm going to find about myasthenia gravis, or whatever that thing is, and that I don't know about, or I've I've learned in chiropractic college, but it's fallen behind. Ellers Danlos, I, I uh, at one point I started seeing a lot of Ellers Danlos patients coming through my clinic, and it's a rare condition, but I'm seeing lots of them. So I took it on myself to learn everything about Ellers Danlos, and I've, we've talked about that. It's it's one of those things that, that connective tissue disorder that chiropractors should be aware of that, and now I've, I have a pretty good understanding of that and what we should do, what we shouldn't do, and if every day you're moving forward, you're getting to be a better doctor. Now they've done studies that show medical doctors. And they've done several studies that they've monitored their, their ability to practice evidence-based practice over their lifetime. And most of them at the highest level, the day they graduate from their residency program, and it decreases sure. till they die. 
And with rare exceptions, unless you're in a teaching hospital or you're actively seeking knowledge, we're all on a descending course. Mm Mm-hmm. My kids I have told I'm me not. I'm getting stupid. Yes. <laughs> You're getting stupid. No, you, yeah, I'm sure present company excluded. But but the, like Allard Danlos is a, is a great example because I, I did the same thing a few years ago because hypermobility is present in a lot of our patients. And then you find out that that particular diagnosis has like what, eight or nine subtypes? Ten. D- ten? Some authors at six, some is ten. Right. So eight or nine? <laughs> I guess right. No, okay, but, I, yeah. but but the, there's no way that clinically you're going to differentiate those because there are genetic differences. But knowing that, I didn't know that ten years ago. No. So I went out and I said, "Well, look at that. I wonder. I wonder. I wonder." And the answer is out there for me. And with it, you know, we were just. I was just talking to some students in the clinic yesterday, and they were going over LS dental. So there's more conditions out there. But the the idea is, you know. Once you get the hang of it, it's you're looking at they have blue sclera. Do they have a high palate? Do they have crooked teeth? Can, can they, do, is the bite and score you know six or higher? And to have that in in and what can I do about it? and what shouldn't I do? And then it, it also produces more curiosity. Are these the patients that could be getting the the, the vascular dissection their their uh, vertebral artery dissections right. because they have increased fragility of their vessels and increased orthopedic mobility? And as we run down that rabbit hole. That just that, as a clinician who has sure. been out of school for thirties and on years, um, going back and learning that, and, and hopefully being back up to date with this, on that one aspect of care. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it also, when you do that kind of um, inquiry, self, you know, looking for yourself, you also tend to revisit a lot of other information that you may have forgotten about. Like, for instance, who's the other group of people that we were taught are more susceptible to vertebral artery dissections? Are the people in the 30s to 40s age mm-hmm. group where they're gotten relatively hypermobile because they have they're getting older and their muscle their holding elements are weaker so they have but they haven't be reduced their range of motion by osteophytosis so much so they they're at they're considered at risk but that's what the alert download people are genetically so you review my point is it's it's a good example of how you can review a lot of other things at the same time and basically take an inventory of your own knowledge is really... Yes, and one thing leads to another in yeah. the discussions. And then the next day, somebody else comes in. Right. And they have a different condition and, or they're not responding. So it's it's um, the ability... And, and with it, this is where... So, I know we talked, you, you're not crazy about social media. You're more like into... Get I'm, it. Not, I'm not mature enough for social media. <laughs> oh, you, you get screaming and yelling. At, oh, you dirty... No, but it's it is... <laughs> There's a lot of arrogance and self righteousness uh, you know, that's shared on this, and surely not. Oh, it's <laughs> truly it's and and it's misplaced, and it's usually the the you know the, oh you know if you didn't know this you dummy, and it's, there's so many levels to to knowledge that you have people who are like you don't know what you don't know, and 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 frankly it's it's the more you get into this, I hope you get more humble as you get deeper into the science. For me, it's the further I get into this, it's like there's less and less that I really know. So that I have less certainty, I have more curiosity. Hopefully, it doesn't affect my self confidence. Mm-hmm. So, any any other pearls of wisdom before we move on? So it's been it's been a joy to have you. I'll try to think of one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so who who's been your big inspiration in, in chiropractic or in, in uh, Mike research? Wilds? Yeah, you, they, I'll tell him every time. Oh my goodness! Every time I see him, I'll tell anyone. He was a formative. He was the most had the most impression on me and my career and what I've wanted to do and why I've wanted to do it. And it was a simple principles and practice course that he taught at a level that is probably not taught at all in the chiropractic profession any longer. Wow. You, how about you? Now I Brian? I didn't know Jeff when I went through CMCC because I had a couple of kids and I was I was pretty caught up with that. We weren't in the same class. But I would have said the same thing. It was uh, it was Mike Wiles who introduced us to chiropractic principles, introduced uh, me to Dr. Sato's work, and interestingly introduced Dr. Sato to me. There you go. And that's that made the connection, which uh, led so me to the lab. One person led you guys to your life's work. What was it he did? What was the thing that he did that that set the fire? He was excited about the tenets of chiropractic from a sane standpoint. So 
He liked chiropractic, but he didn't want it. He didn't want the crazy. There actually was very little crazy. He taught us from a balanced view what the neurobiological mechanisms, how little we knew, but what was proposed. He was not partisan, I guess is the right term. Mm -hmm. He didn't care where the information came from, medical, osteopathic, uh, the Kellogg Foundation, chiropractic, whatever. He just taught us how to differentiate theories from, re, you know, facts from theories. And um, I don't think very many people paid attention in that class. Apparently, apparently two but people did. a few did. of us did. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it made us, it basically, I think that triggered us. I think I would probably ended up a uh, lifelong kind of learner. I guess that's the thing. But it triggered me into knowing and where I wanted to go and what questions I thought were important. Lifelong learner. Today, you guys spoke to the, our neuro club here on, at Parker's campus. <clears throat> Great lectures. And you know, your, mo your model for visceral dysfunction, drawing it out there, it was, it was brilliant. It's simple. I, mean, I wish we could, we could show that to the, to the audience watching this, but it was, it was really good to show the validating chiropractic to our students, but not doing it through you know, an oversimplified model. Brian and I actually study the same thing for the same reason, just with slightly different approaches, and um, they're very complementary. And why I don't know why we haven't actually had most of our career together, but we've tried a little bit more. Oh, we're There's working still on time now. Yeah, you guys time. <clears throat> There's still time. Well, you've established yourselves. Um, you know, I'd I'd love to learn more about it. I'd love to learn more about the how the chiropractic adjustment affects the organs. Um, that so was we. Oh my gosh, it's, it's <laughs> but the thing is, is you're you're validating chiropractic. You're just not overstating your research. We try not to, or I try not. To. Yeah, I don't. I don't think we set out to validate anything. We've we've challenged um, some of these basic concepts, which Mike introduced us uh, to. But I would have been just as happy to disprove the stuff, which in fact we seem to be supporting. You're seeking truth. That makes me sound like a better person than I actually <laughs> yeah. am. <laughs> Facts. <laughs> You're answering questions. Answering questions. <laughs> Well, thank you both for visiting Parker today. We've had a great time, and I just like just so grateful that you would take time out of your busy schedule to come visit us. It's been eye opening in a very, very positive way. Oh, good. Yeah, thank you very much for having us. You're thank welcome. You. Blessing to you both. Thank you.